This is a Beggy Sisa podcast. Young people, they are not good about any kind of prevention. It's going to do with HIV. Once it goes in, you don't even know it's there. Could an implant the size of a matchstick save the next generation of young women from getting infected with HIV? We will know the answer in about six years. Welcome to this podcast. I am Mia Malan. Today we talk to Salim Abdul Karim, the director of the Center for the AIDS Program of Research in South Africa, Caprisa. More than 1,000 South African girls and young women between the ages of 15 and 24 contract HIV each week. Most of them get the virus from men about 10 years their senior. But Caprisa is testing a device that could stop this cycle of transmission. One of the first studies ever done at a community level in Africa was done back in 1990. That's almost 30 years ago. And that study, led by Croatia, showed very high prevalence in young girls, but almost or very little HIV infection in young boys. Now, that was striking to us. And it told us epidemiologically that young girls were acquiring HIV from older men. Well, we showed definitively in 2016 using phylogenetics, a new technique now that has become available where we sequenced thousands of viruses and we were able to link individuals based on the similarity of their viruses. And we were able to show quite compellingly that Young girls, teenage girls predominantly, were acquiring HIV in very high rates from men in their late 20s and early 30s. The interesting thing that you're mentioning is that it's teenage girls who get HIV from men in their late 20s or early 30s. The general perception out there is that people talk of sugar daddies or blessers, and I think it's men who are a lot older than men in their late 20s or early 30s that girls get HIV from. Yes, and I think that's been part of the confusion. If you look at the data we have, it's very clear that the average age difference between these young girls, particularly teenage girls and their male partners from whom they are acquiring HIV, it's between 8 and 10 years. So in other words, these very young girls are acquiring HIV from men about 10 years older. Now, the notion that has been conveyed by the use of terminology such as sugar daddies or blessers makes it sound like, you know, these are sort of dirty old men who are preying on these young girls. It's actually far from the truth. In reality, these are mostly fairly young men, as I said, mostly in their 30s. And we have a better understanding of the nature of the way in which HIV is being transmitted. Put simply, if young girls had sex only with young boys, the HIV epidemic would pretty much peter out because everybody's going to get infected, gets infected, and that's it. But because of this age disparate sex, there's a never ending supply of young girls that these older men can infect. And so the HIV epidemic grows at a magnitude that we would otherwise not see. And this difference in the age is central to understanding why the epidemic is so severe in South Africa. Because when you think about it, how are these men getting HIV? If they are passing HIV to these young girls, they have to be getting it from somewhere. And they acquire it, as we know from the phylogenetics, they acquire it from women in their 30s. So women in their 30s are transmitting HIV to men in their 30s. These men have a second partner or a third partner who is a young girl, and they transmit HIV to that young girl. These young girls then grow up, and when they reach their 30s, They transmit HIV to the next group of men in their 30s, and that's how we see the cycle of HIV transmission. 
One of the biomedical interventions that researchers like yourself have come up with to protect young women and men against um, protection is the HIV prevention pill or pre-exposure prophylaxis. But it seems like young women don't really have a very good uptake of PrEP at demonstration sites. What are we doing wrong? The young people, they are not good about any kind of prevention. It's going to do with HIV. They would drive, you know, at higher speeds. They would, you know, jump off cliffs. And they would do things that are risky. And that, in fact, is the age at which to do risky things. So when you take that group and you now tell that group to think about the fact that they may be at risk of HIV and that they need to take a tablet every day, that's simply a bridge too far. So we've come to realize that we have got to find some way in which to protect young girls so that they don't have to actively acknowledge and think about their risk of HIV every day and then have to act every day. What are those new ways? Are they injections or implants? There are many different things that groups are working on, but the two main streams of research are to look at injectables, and these are injections that you would have to take monthly or six-weekly or two-monthly, depending on how long they last. And uh, the alternative is to take something that's longer acting. We, from our experience, have found that you know, asking a woman to take a monthly injection is almost as difficult as asking them to take a daily pill. So that's not going to get us very far. So we've opted for the option of trying to make something that would last a whole year. And uh, working with a group in the U.S. and with colleagues in Europe we are developing a matchstick size implant. It's a little silicone implant that has a highly potent drug called tenofova alafenamide, TAF for short. And we take tenofova alafenamide and we fill it into this little tube and we can insert it under the skin. And it releases small amounts of tenofova alafenamide each day enough, we think, to protect a woman from getting HIV. We are in the last stages of manufacture at the moment. We'll probably put this into the first group of women within the next sort of six months or so, and we'll start assessing how does it work in humans. We know it works in dogs. We tested it there, but you know, putting something in humans is a very different kettle of fish, and so... Once we know that this implant is releasing at the correct rate in humans, we can then proceed, once we know it's there and it's safe, we can proceed to testing to see if it protects them against HIV. Where will you insert it? Is it in your arm or is it in any part of your body? And do you have any expectations as to by how much it will reduce the risk of getting HIV? We have opted to go with a very simple method of implantation. Uh, We're considering putting it into the same area where contraceptive implants are put, which is on the biceps area of the arm. Once it goes in, you don't even know it's there. It's gone in, there's there's no telltale signs that you have an implant. So nobody knows that you have an implant and you will yourself not be able to feel it after a few days. And if it does its work properly, it should at the end of the year have just a little bit of drug left, in which case we would have to then come in, make a small incision, pull it out and put a new one in. So it needs to be replaced once a year. And that's good to do because that way once a year we can also test somebody for HIV to see if they've acquired HIV in the meantime. So how effective can we expect it to be? That's a good question. The answer is we don't know, but I can hypothesize that if it works as we think it does, it should be quite a highly effective way of preventing HIV, meaning that we would want to see an effect that it should prevent at least three-quarters of all HIV infections. And if it does that, 
then it's a potentially a game changer. It could alter the course of the HIV epidemic. Just think about it for a moment. If we went in KwaZulu-Natal, where young girls have the highest risk of HIV, and we simply had a program where you went to every school once a year, and every girl in every school had an implant inserted, provided they agree to it, and one year later you just went back, you tested them for HIV, and you replaced the implant. I mean, that is a doable intervention. It's within our means to do something like that. And if we can protect these young girls from acquiring HIV, we break that cycle of HIV transmission I talked about. It means we'll have a whole generation of teenage girls who will not have HIV when they reach their 30s to infect men. So that would be a central feature of trying to break the cycle of HIV transmission. That was Professor Salim Abdul Karim, who is the co-director and founder of the Centre for the Programme of AIDS Research in South Africa. The production for this podcast was done by Dylan Bush and Danny Boyson. Until next time, I'm Mia Malan. This was a Pegasus podcast.